Hello, everyone. We are just uh, about a minute away from starting this edition of Coffee with Kalefi. So my name is Max Rohr. I'm one of the trainers here at Kalefi. We actually have, I think, the entire Kalefi training staff is on, <laughs> on the call today. So this is going to be a contractor-focused uh, presentation where we're going to talk about some of the tips and tricks uh, for the heating season from a panel of experts, internal and external. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with a couple of the housekeeping things. Okay, if you're having an issue with the audio, what the best scenario is just to log out and log back in. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Uh, you can also call tech support or something like that, but I would just recommend logging out and logging back in. Can you receive a copy of the presentation? Yes, just hit yes in the post webinar survey. And then we'll put this up on YouTube as well. And that's where we've got 14 years of Coffee with Kalefi presentations are up on the YouTube channel if you want to go look at that. And we've been adding chapters and things like that too. So if there's just something very specific you want to know in a one hour long webinar, you can navigate right to that. Okay, you can get a certificate of attendance for one PDH. It depends on the jurisdiction if you're allowed to you know, report these, but we're happy to send those to you uh, if you. Uh, stay for the, the whole webinar today and then this is our re latest release of hydronics so hydronics 33 is on heat pump water heater fundamentals we've seen this you know heat pump water heaters are growing quite a bit still a small portion of the market but it is something that could explode as far as the department of energy regulations to say hey we're not doing electric water heaters anymore you have to incorporate some heat pump uh, piece to that equipment that could be a manufacturing change that we see sooner than later and this edition will help you kind of stay ahead of that that curve a little bit and it's also available hydronics.kalefi.com as an interactive digital edition so we have a pdf or a hard copy that you can sign up to get in the mail as well as hydronics.kalefi.com where you can read through it kind of like a long scroll magazine or something like that different format that's really helpful so next month we're going to have a uh, returning guest, John Siegenthaler, is going to be with us. He's going to talk about dual fuel systems. So this is kind of an interesting topic, especially where John is located in New York State, where there's a big push in the five boroughs and you know, some of the, the bigger cities in New York to switch to decarbonized systems. But realistically, can we keep some of that equipment for a longer service life and then just add air to water heat pumps as kind of a hybrid system is that more realistic he'll kind of go through some of the the details to help evaluate if that would be a good path forward so today we are going to talk about heating season and this is going to be as i said before kind of a contractor's perspective for the engineers on the call uh, i always think it's helpful to kind of see what's happening out in the field to see how we're keeping these systems up and running as they were drawn or as they were spec'd originally so here is the agenda. We're going to have uh, Bob Hot Rod Roar and Dan Furcus talk about some experiences they had in the field, uh, how they make it work. And then a little bit later in the presentation, we're going to have Matt Lebo is going to join us from uh, out in Massachusetts to tell us what he's seeing this heating season. He's one of our favorite contractors out in the field. And then we'll wrap up with Cody Mack, who's going to cover the five things you need to know based on his five things you need to know YouTube series. That's a, that's a quick hit way to learn more about the industry as well. So let's start with uh, Bob and Dan. Still one of the weirdest parts of my job is uh, calling my dad Bob at work because it's the only time in, uh, in our entire like family lives that, that that's ever occurred. So welcome Bob and Dan. So we'll get started today. Uh, I think that this is a, a big topic that always comes up. Bob, do you wanna tell us a little bit more about why air might be the problem? Yeah, I think more than anything every year, you know, the beginning of the heating season, um, air comes up. You know, I, I kind of monitor a bunch of the different chat rooms and uh, oh, heating help and some of the other social media sites. And it seems like air this time of year is just over and over the biggest problem I see out there. and. Uh, so I wanted to address, you know, if you're building the system from the ground up, like some of them that you'll see that Matt's going to show us a little bit later, it's pretty easy to deal with air. I mean, we've got enough product now. We know where to put it and how to install it and, uh, you know, how to pressurize our boilers and stuff. But it's jobs like this that you walk into that this job has obviously had air problems just by the number of, I don't know if there's even another place where you can put another air vent. But, 
you know, he could add six more to that picture and is probably not going to get rid of the air problems that he has because he doesn't have a good central air scrubber there. So we're going to look at some of the uh, slides here and show you some of the things that you can do to avoid these problems or to fix these problems on a troubleshooting call. So it's, it's not that hard if you understand the, um, the technology of how air um, works in the system and the pressure and everything that relates to it. So, yeah, that was a job. Where was that? In New Jersey? That was that house that we stayed at, I think, once. That we yeah, this was an Airbnb, and it was during the summer, so I don't know if the seating season works, but it's one of my favorite pictures because you can just kind of do the, like, crime scene investigation here that, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of air vents, uh, probably an air problem that was never addressed properly, new fill valve, maybe a newer expansion tank, newer, you know, venting material, a lot of rusty water has been on top of this boiler. So there's probably been an air issue all along. There may have been a condensing problem all along, but those are good things to, to look for. If, if just three air vents could solve the air problem, it, it would have here. And you can see that they're still not quite happy with that. Um, so yeah, we'll talk more about placement and uh, air separation as an alternative here. So. Okay, what, uh, why is pressure important in, in this context? Yeah, so there's two pressures that we talk about in a closed loop hydronic system. The first is what we call the static or the fill pressure. And that's the pressure that you, the installer, the troubleshooter are gonna put into the system. And what that pressure has to do with is how high up in the building you have to lift water. So it takes just under a half a pound, 0.433 PSI to lift water up a foot. So if you round that up to five, you can do the math quickly in your head. So if you've got a 30 foot tall building, you're gonna need at least 15 pounds of pressure to get the water up to the top of the building. Now, if you don't have enough pressure, like in the picture there, you're gonna have an air bubble at the top and that air bubble is just gonna stay there. You know, there's no way to squeeze that out unless we put more pressure on that system. So, um, you know, just when you're on a troubleshooting call, especially as you're driving up to the building, you can kind of get a visual, you know, how tall is this building? If it's a four story apartment building or just a, you know, single story residence, you can kind of in your head start thinking, well, yeah, I'm going to need 15 pounds or I'm going to need 35 pounds to, to get the water to the top of a taller building. So. Um, that's, you know, most of the pressure reducing valves that we put on systems come uh, preset at 12 PSI, and that'll do your, you know, average two-story home. That's going to get you up to the top of the building. And we would like to have at the top of this building, if that was filled all the way up, about five pounds of positive pressure. So if we do have air vents, like you saw in that previous picture, that five pound helps them make their seal. So the float floats up and a little extra pressure kind of squeezes that so we get a good shut off. So uh, if you use that 0.50, you kind of add that little buffer uh, pressure into the into your equation. So that's what you need to check first is how much pressure is in the building. Because sometimes you can get rid of a an air problem or a chronic air problem by just boosting up the pressure five pounds. You know, that air bubble that's in there, if I just squeeze that another couple PSI, I'm going to squeeze that bubble out. Or if I've got small bubbles that are going around and around, adding some pressure will squeeze them together so they can get back to where there might be an air vent or an air separator of the system. And of course, when we do that, the expansion tank has to be checked before you connect it to the system. You have to take an air, you know, a, a you know, tire gauge or a RV type of tire gauge and check the pre-charge on that expansion tank. Most people will put that exactly at the fill pressure they're going to put in. So if it's going to be a 12 PSI fill, they'll put that at 12. Some guys will have it a little bit lower, and that allows just a little bit of water to go into the tank. So if the pressure uh, or the temperature in the building goes way down, you don't see a, a zero pressure on your gauge and think you have a leak somewhere. But typically, pre-charge it to whatever the um, the fill pressure is going to be. Okay. Can you switch that one, Rox? Oh, oh, there go. goes Max. Uh, All right, I'm gonna go ahead and take over. Yeah, give me just a second. All right. Now the other pressure, since we're stuck on the slide, would be dynamic pressure. And if you had a gauge right next to your circulator pump. When that kicks on, you'll see the pressure that that circulator can add to the system. So the two pressures we'll talk about are static pressure, fill pressure, and also dynamic pressure, which is when you turn the system on, plug in the pump, or fire up one of the zones or something like that. And uh, important to this is that you have a good gauge to know what you have exactly. So 
Oh, there's me and well, Dan right Dan. Yep. <laughs> and you talk about expansion tank pressure. I mean, it's important to check it anytime you're putting in a new expansion tank, yeah. whether you're, you're replacing one or it's the first time putting in an expansion tank. And don't trust that the whatever it says on it is exactly what you got when you take it out of the box. It can lose, you know, some pressure if they've been sitting on a shelf for a long period of time somewhere or something like that. So right. you always want to check it and get a low pressure gauge. Don't try and check it with a hundred psi gauge. Mm. You know, you'd be off five pounds if you don't have good resolutions. I find those little RV type of gauges that you use on, uh, you know, RVs that have low tire pressures also I think go up to about 20 psi. So it, it's right in the number that you want to see accurately. Right. Perfect. You guys can see my screen now. I think we're back up and running. Yep, okay. we're good. All right, perfect. Go ahead and go on to the next one here. All right, thanks for jumping in there and doing that. <clears throat> so yeah, I would say you know invest if you're a troubleshooter or even an installer, get a good gauge. You know it's worth spending you know, another ten bucks and get like these. I call them glycerin filled or liquid filled gauges. The nice thing about these gauges here is the one in the upper right there. The um, in fact, I got a couple more. I I ordered when I uh, started doing this. Uh, the needles don't bounce off as they rattle around in your truck because the liquid kind of keeps the needle, you know, captive in there a little bit better than just a regular gauge. And then what I would do is those little um, adapters you can get down at the bottom. Those are nice because you can screw it right down a hose. But if you've got a purge valve in the system or a boiler drain at the bottom of the boiler, you can screw that on there and just swap out the gauges. You certainly don't need a 200 psi gauge on the hydronic work. So if you got that upper 30 pound gauge and swapped it into one of these little manifolds at the bottom, uh, then you can use that for hydronic work or for you know domestic water uh, testing by just switching out your gauge. That one on the bottom right is made by Winners. I like that. I don't know where you can buy that, but it's got a little nicer a manifold to it, and that you could put a little <clears throat> air pressure on there if you wanted to you know do a system with an air pressure test or something like that. So it's kind of a multi-purpose uh, test gauge as well as a a pre-charge gauge on it so and you can buy these at pretty much anywhere hardware stores uh, you know the box stores have these in different versions and different brands so i would say get a good gauge because um in fact two of the um threads on heating help right now have to do with oh yeah you know my gauge on my boiler says i've got 15 pounds of pressure but i still got noise and air problems and uh, as soon as they went and bound another gauge and put it on there learned that the gauge wasn't especially those compound gauges where they're tempering pressure I don't know. I don't think those are the highest quality gauges in the world. They tend to be off sometimes five or 10 pounds, which isn't uh, on a 12 pound system isn't going to help you much. So um, yeah, that's my spiel on gauges. Okay. So here's what happens when we have the relationship of the expansion tank and the circulator backwards mixed up. So typically when you pump away from an expansion tank what's going to happen is whatever pressure differential that little circulator can uh, uh, increase the system by just the centrifugal force of spinning the water through there is going to show up as a positive pressure everywhere in the system so in this picture if i was pumping away from the expansion tank that little what six pounds of pressure differential that little call it a double seven can generate it would add to the system all the way around that so we would right at the exit of the circulator we'd have you know the 18 pounds of pressure and as we went around the building we'd use up or scrub away that head energy that we've added to the system here's what happens in that previous slide that we showed you that boiler back in new jersey was pipe drawn too it had the pumps on the return and so you can see here pumping at the expansion tank what happens is now the circulator says well wait a second i can't add pressure to an expansion tank i can't take it out of there where would i put it so it makes its pressure differential from the suction side of the pump so even though I had this building filled at five pounds of static fill pressure, now when the circulator starts, you can see on the inlet side of it, I've dropped down to a negative three pounds of pressure. So everything from that point all the way back to the upper right corner there is under negative pressure. It's under a vacuum. So if I were to put one of these uh, air vents like you see on the right there, the upper right, anywhere along there, like maybe up on a, a radiator and air handler up on the ceiling somewhere, I could pull air into an air vent. The same thing that makes air come out of a vent could allow air to go into a vent. So um, the problem there is the expansion tank relationship to the circulator. It needs to either move the circulator to the other side or just take that expansion tank and cut a new T, put it on the other side of the circulator and immediately the pressures go up, immediately the air problems go away. Now we do have a little uh, quick fix up on the upper, very upper right there. You can see that's a cap that we make. And it's basically just a check valve. It's an anti-siphon cap, we call it. And it fits on, I think, most all the vents and the separators, don't they, Dan? It has that yeah. same thread. Yeah, they do. 
And so what this will do is it'll let air come out of a system if you do have it a place where, you know, when it heats up, some air wants to come out, but it'll keep air from going back in. Now it's a, it's a Band-Aid. You should go back to this job here on the left and fix that. Maybe you do it, you know, at the end of the heating season or something like that. But if you need a quick, a quick fix on a chronic air problem, sometimes just putting that little cap on there, they'll, you know, say, yeah, you fixed it, whatever you did, it's, uh, it's working now, but really it's still, you got an issue with your expansion tank. And then there on the bottom right, we also make a couple adapters for our vents if you wanted to put little discharge tubes. So if you have that vent above a boiler and you don't want it to drip into the boiler someday, you can put that adapter and put a piece of uh, uh, 3 8 or quarter inch copper tube and take it down to the floor so it doesn't, uh, usually it's gonna spit on your electronics inside the boiler when it leaks, the most expensive part. So that can maybe help you out sometime if you do have to have a vent. Most of the ModCon boilers will have a vent, and you can see the one behind me at the very top of it. So that as you fill that boiler, it's really in there to make sure that the, you get all the air out of the heat exchanger. But, you know, someday all vents are going to leak, so we don't want it to leak where it can cause uh, more problems. So, okay. Now, one, one more thing on that, if you can go back there, Cody. So on that picture there, I'm showing, you know, five pounds of static pressure. And we did that so that we could show a negative when that pump that's only developing six pounds of pressure would pull that into a negative. Now, the other thing that could happen is you could have 12 pounds of static fill pressure and you could have a high head pump. So let's say you've got a, whatever, a 2699 that can develop 15 pounds of pressure differential. We would have the same thing happening. We could have a higher fill pressure, but the pump, with its delta P um, being much higher, we could still pull a negative. So those are the jobs you probably most often see pulled into a negative where somebody, for whatever reasons, put a high head pump on the system. They think they need a bigger pump for whatever reason. And uh, that's when you can get into these uh, pulling a negative condition in these systems. Okay. Now this here, I built these when we were doing a lot of solar thermal work, and it, you would take this along when you're doing a, a checkup on a solar thermal, because sometimes we'd want to take a little bit of fluid out, a little bit of glycol out to test it with the, um, uh, the pH meter and the refractometer, make sure we got a good uh, glycol mix in there. And I said, well, now I got to put glycol back into it. So instead of bringing the pump cart down the stairs and five gallons of glycol, you can just make these little glycol pigs, we call them for propane injection glycol. It's just um, it, it's just a regular expansion tank, and you can put uh, different types of valves on them there. And so you can just pump into that. Uh, you can put plain water in it, but usually you pump glycol in there, and you can see the lazy hand gauge on the bottom left there, take it up to 60 pounds of pressure. Then I've got the pressure reducing valve there, taking it down to 12 or 15, whatever I want to put in my system. So it's a nice portable way to, to um, take some fluid along with you. You could also leave this on a system if you're checking for uh, an air leak overnight or something like that, because with that small amount of fluid in there, the gauge is going to drop pretty quickly if you do have a leak in a tube somewhere. So it's a handy way to, um, uh, you know, just add some fluid to a system or put a little uh, fill system on a glycol system. Say, hey Bob, when you when you go to fill these guys up, how much fluid should you be putting in there? I found you can get about three, just a little over three gallons in those number 30 tanks if you push it in there, which if you go to the Amtrail site, that's their acceptance ratio. Now I probably got that diaphragm pretty well stretched out <laughs> under that condition, but I'm not using this tank forever. I'm just using it as right. a portable way to haul some water or glycol around with me. But yeah, you can pump them up to, I think they're rated at 80 pounds, maybe a hundred pounds on some brand. So uh, the tank will hold it. It's um, you just pump it in there and then put your uh, reducing valve on it to get it down to what you want. Perfect. Oh, oh by the way, sorry. one other thing it's at the bottom of the screen, I just barely saw it. The gray knob on the bottom of them with the cluffy fill valves, by the way, is a shutoff valve. So if you did want to, you know, pump that up and you had a gauge maybe on the on the uh, pressure reducing valve there, you could fill it up, get it to say 12 pounds of pressure, turn that gray knob all the way in. What is that? Uh, counterclockwise I think screws it in there and now you've trapped the water into the system away from that expansion tank so now you can see a pressure decrease like almost instantly if there's a leak somewhere that gauge is going to quickly drop off so people think that's an adjuster or something but it's actually a shutoff valve for the um the flow of that valve for sure yeah so yeah those are some great points there Bob as far as you know trying to to, to manage and, and deal with air in these hydronic systems. And it's, it's something that, you know, it's pretty commonly overlooked, you know, as far as expansion tank placement and, you know, where to put a lot of these devices. So uh, I think that was a great way to really go through this. And I think up next, we've got Mr. Dan Furkus uh, talking about testing system operation and zoning and talking about controls.
Yeah, so I wanted to talk about how to be uh, proactive on your preventative maintenance calls. You know, when you're out there, you're thinking about cleaning the combustion side of the system, removing air and um, cleaning dirt separators, but you should also take the time and test the zoning controls and options, you know, test the zone pumps and valves, make sure that, you know, when they're seeing a call from a thermostat, they're actually coming on and doing what they should need to do, what they need to do. Um, this is a good time to evaluate, you know, the wiring in the system. So you look here to the left, you have a, a junction box that somebody pre-built their own relay box. You know, it's a good time to, you know, test the relays, make sure that they're coming on and off. They're turning on the, the correct pump or opening the valve, turning on the boiler when, when each thermostat calls. Maybe time to label something in there so that if you are back on a night or weekend or emergency call that, you know, you, you have a little direction, you've already sorted that out. Um, if you're working with zone valves, you look at that center picture. Um, here's an older system where, you know, they're controlling the motor, cycling the 24 volts through the thermostat. You wanna make sure that those motors are opening, um, but then they tie all the, all the end switches together back to the boiler control. So it's important to test each one individually to make sure that each one of the end switch closing turns that boiler on. I mean, if you have a, a number of wires, wire nutted together, you know, you could have a something break underneath the wire nut. And now maybe the first zone is turning on the system, but the second or third zone, the end switch isn't getting back to complete the call. Um, at that point, if this is what you're running into, you know, it's a good time to maybe be proactive and talk to the customer about adding a zoning relay, like you see on the right. You know, it's a, it's a nice uh, simplified option that labels everything where thermostat and valve or pump locations are, has some diagnostic lights that simplifies it for troubleshooting, um, has some additional features. I know we had a pre-submitted question that asked about how do we manage the water quality and, and pumps in the off season. And with a zone relay that, you know, with, with the first two options, you look, you really can't. I mean, you really have no way to do that. But with the zone relay, there is a, a post a pump purge. I'm sorry, not a pump purge, a pump exercise feature built in. And what that will do is after 72 hours of off time, it will turn the pump on. So it keeps those pumps working in the off season. It moves a little bit of water in the system, which, you know, might remove a little dirt through a dirt separator. Maybe it'll, you know, pop an air bubble out through an air vent or separator. Um, so that, it's a nice feature in the off season. Um, also shows diagnostic lights that, you know, you can label the, the zones and educate your customer and maybe that will help you, you know, in the event of a service issue. Yeah, I'd also say too, Dan, I, I think it's really interesting, you know, we're typically so used to like a, a normally closed type of a zone valve, okay? Um, this is a good time to understand what kind of components are in these systems, especially if you're, if the new customer for you or anything like that. I just remember the first time I ever ran into, a, it was a normally open zone valve that was, it was, I, I believe it was a brand called Automag, if I remember correctly, but but the fact was is that all the controls were reversed from what we're normally used to, right. you know, it wasn't a normally open thermostat, it was a normally closed thermostat, you know, and so so understanding all that stuff, so when you, you know, inevitably have to come back to a job that looks like this on the left-hand side at midnight someday, it's not, uh, not such a, a problem, so. Right, it's just taking time to understand the system and maybe simplify it so that, you know, it's easier for the customer to understand what they have in living in their home and it helps you when you walk in in an emergency situation. Yeah, and sorry, I forgot to click ahead there to go to the pre-submitted question. Yeah, the fact is, is that, yeah, we've got that function where it'll cycle those circulators after a certain amount of time and keep them from uh, seizing up over summer, so, all right. Um, and also take the time and test the, with testing the controls, check each thermostat. You'll cycle the thermostat. If it's a mechanical thermostat, it gives you the opportunity to see if it's still in calibration. If it's a, a battery-powered thermostat, it gives you the opportunity to make sure the batteries are still good um, and the thermostat's not sitting there dead on the wall. Um, one other thing it does is it allows you to see if the customer made any upgrades. You know, with all the advances with Wi-Fi and smart thermostats on the market, you know, a lot of customers walking through a big box store see that, and it's it's um, pretty. Uh, pretty nice for them to have so they'll a lot of them will buy that and upgrade them on their own so you know you got to remember that the smart thermostats are universal thermostats they're designed to control you know hydronic systems forced air systems 
you know, single stage up to, you know, two or three stage controls. So, you know, you want to make sure that thermostat's set up properly. You want to make sure it's wired properly. Um, also, the, the smart thermostats require a 24-volt volt power source to, to power them. Um, so that may require a common wire that a customer doesn't really know anything about or hasn't connected. So it gives you the opportunity to evaluate that wiring. And, you know, if there's something you need to do ahead of time, you can you can get that taken care of before we jump into the heating season. Well, yeah, even come into the multiple systems too, where maybe a customer replaced their thermostat, but they have an air handler for air conditioning and they've got a boiler for heating. And now you're talking split sub bases and all kinds of other fun stuff like right. that. There's there's a lot of things that can go go south uh, in a quick hurry on a, on a homeowner upgrade sometimes. So Right, yeah, it just gives you the opportunity to determine if that happened on one or any of the zones and stay ahead of that. I had a dollar for everybody that shows up at Heating Help, a homeowner that put on their own Nest thermostat or eco. <laughs> you know, where do all the wires go and they're not, the colors don't match and stuff. It's yeah, it's not an easy thing to do on your own. Yeah, right. yeah it definitely isn't, especially for a homeowner who doesn't do it every day. Yeah, I don't remember who the manufacturer was. There must have been a lot of them that used to have those tiny little labels that they'd wrap around the ends of the wires, and there'd, mm -hmm. there'd be about two inches of excess wire sticking out of the wall, and every one of them had a little white label on it. That was <laughs> that was your clue that you needed to double check exactly what happened in there. So right, right, all um, right. So let's I, finish it off here, Dan. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to talk about you know know what you're walking into, and and that's one of the advantages. You know, if you can talk to that customer and educate them and um, upgrade to a zone control panel, it, it helps you when you get that call because I think you know, a lot of us have been there. The homeowner calls and they tell you, I have no heat. Well, you know, take the time and ask some questions, you know, find out if they, they, if they don't have heat in the entire building or if it's just one area. I mean, because when, when you're looking at prioritizing your schedule, you know, you might ask that question and the customer says, well, you know, no, I have no heat in my entire building. Okay, well now you're a priority. I need to get out there, but you know maybe they tell you that um, I have heat on the main floor and lower level. It's just the second floor. So you know then you know at that point you know if you have a relay panel in place, you can talk to that customer, have them go down, and maybe give you a little information off there. You know, are you seeing any lights lit up on the front? You know, and maybe they are. Maybe they're start out maybe they don't see any lights lit up well now you know if you're walking into a power issue to the control or you know maybe they tell you i just have a green light lit up but nothing else now you you want to have them maybe check thermostats and you know maybe you can talk them through some of the issues before you get out there and and one correct the problem or, or two have a better understanding what you're going into so you know for example if they tell you yep all the lights are lit up and i hear the boiler coming on and off uh, well, now you might you might be walking into a pump that's out. You know, the boiler's cycling, but the pump's not moving any water. So, you know, trying to be prepared when you're walking into those calls to know do I have to stop at the at the distribute at the distributor and pick up a pump or a zone valve, or you know, have an idea kind of why you're walking in there and what what you're walking into. Also, if you can offer a solution, if you tell the customer, oh, it sounds like your pump's out, I'm gonna pick one up and I'll be over in a couple hours. It builds a little confidence with the customer that you know what you're walking into. Yeah, and if you could ever get to those scenarios where you can walk through a customer on on you know how to check mm -hmm. things out, and I mean they they don't forget that stuff as customers, you know, and they 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 recognize that you're trying to help make the situation better, you know, even if you're right. not charging them, you know, and uh, there's no better way to look like a hero than uh, saving them an after hour service call on a Saturday uh, when you don't want to put your boots back on. So, so yeah. right, absolutely. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Uh, we're going to move it along here to Max and Mr. LeBeau. Yeah, sorry about that. The uh, ice cream truck went by, so I logged out quick. To <laughs> that. So uh, next up, we're going to uh, talk about some of the photos that uh, we've seen come across the Instagram feed from Matt LeBeau. So what we're going to start with is one of my favorite pictures. This is when you came to Milwaukee to visit the group for kind of a contractor roundtable that we had here. So we've got Matt up front with Bob, but then there's kind of a, a sinister character over the, the shoulder there that I, I recognize that you may hear from a little bit later in this webinar. But, I think shortly um, after yeah. this picture, I was mentioning something about rubbing the lotion on the skin or something like that. I don't know. It's kind of a... 
I would have come up with a better uh, photobomb picture if I would have had some notice there, but yeah. I was uh, I was going to crop it and I was like, nope, I'm just going to leave that <laughs> just like that. So that's Matt, but we had kind of a group of contractors come in to give us feedback from the field. What can we do better? What products are you interested in? What kind of new technologies do you have to adapt to? Uh, and Matt was somebody we figured would be a great person to help us out there. So why don't we go to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit more about some of these specific projects from the Instagram feed. Okay, and mine's coming across a little bit slow, but I think that it's up now. There we go. So uh, tell me a little bit about this job. So why is air and dirt separation? When we were talking before, all of this looks new and shiny, but this isn't a new building, right? No, it's not. No, it's an existing home that was built, uh, I think, in the 1950s. So then what other piping materials did you have to work with here? So you've got shiny new copper. Does that, did you redo the whole house or did you have to work with some other uh, kind of existing stuff out in the building? No, good question. We, um, the indirect was pretty simple, just tying back into the domestic on copper. The copper on the boiler, uh, just that's how we normally do it, but we were tying into a, uh, an existing uh, black steel of, you know, Venturi monoflow system with uh, cast iron baseboard upstairs. And that part, just as a, you know, from a, a longevity standpoint, you've got the big investment of the new boiler, the new indirect tank, all the new ECM pumps, but pretty high potential for a lot of sludge in the system, a lot of magnetite, a lot of debris from, from years of the system. Who knows, maybe that autofill was open that whole time. There are a lot of minerals and things rolling around in there. So how do you kind of decide if and when and uh, and how to use proper dirt separation for a system like that? Well, typically I like it on the return, of course, but uh, flushing through and getting all the air out, um, there's some, some debris that comes back on it, but typically it's letting it run for a little while. Uh, that's what I always have the homeowner do when we're wrapped up with the install. Uh, I'll have them run it for two, three hours. Uh, so I usually come back in a day or two, I'll pull the uh, collar on the magnet, um, and sometimes we get a pretty good uh, amount out, uh, maybe even a, a, a spoonful of uh, pretty good metallic uh, uh, return. Yeah, and I imagine that one was probably uh, a lot more than you would find of just a couple wood chips or something in a, a new system that you were going to do with, you know, radiant or or something that wasn't a bunch of old ferrous materials. Yeah. So then um, let's go to the the next slide here. So one of the things I notice on the feed too is that you use a lot of pointed distribution mixing valves. So it kind of is state by state and city by city and inspector by inspector for when and if you must use a point of distribution or point of use mixing valve, if it's a hospital or a school or whatever. So it seems like you use a lot of the point of distribution mixing valves. What, what does that help you with in, in the projects that you're working on? Well, in Massachusetts, uh, it's not in the code, but, you know, usually refer back to the manufacturer's recommendation. So uh, it goes on. But, I mean, it's just protection as far as uh, the elderly or, or real young or even these uh, uh, slugs of, of uh, real hot water if it's been sitting for a little bit um, and just more consistency. And then as far as the temperatures in these tanks, do you ever run those temperatures up a little bit beyond, you know, on the indirects, usually if they're sized correctly with, with the proper amount of gallonage, no. But on the tanklesses, uh, Massachusetts is a max of 130 on uh, a, a domestic. Um, sometimes I've been known as, even on an electric is, is a good uh, example, I will crank that one up just to store more uh, 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 temperature. And then, of course, with the mixing valve, now I'm not worrying uh, uh, about uh, hurting somebody. Yep, and that's that's smart too because the electrics um, and it's going to come up with heat pump water heaters as well. If the recovery rate isn't as fast as we've, you know, in, in these examples here, the recovery rate to bring that tank back up to temperature after a bunch of showers might be pretty quick. Uh, if we're looking at a smaller electrical element for, uh, I don't know, a light commercial project or undersized in a house, that, that higher storage temperature can be a big help. And then the customer doesn't know anything about it. You know, the they're still getting the same temperature that they've always had. They just have more capacity and that's kind that's of right. the best balance of both there. So, okay, let's go to the next one. This one is uh, a pretty uh, scary thing to walk into here. So I don't know about you, Max, that, that looks delicious. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but the, uh, what was the call here? What, was, what did the homeowner say uh, was wrong here? 
Well, this this was a four story old uh, uh, Victorian uh, uh, mansion type uh, steam uh, original radiators throughout uh, as far as I think the late 1800s. So guaranteed there's going to be a lot of stuff coming back. Um, they never used any detergents or, or uh, you know, a squick uh, cleanup on it. So uh, a lot of muck. So clearly it was a no heat call um, and uh, just kept overfilling um, and just couldn't get it to stop. We tried uh, uh, several options of pulling it out, as you can see, with, with all the sludge that came back. Ultimately, it was it was a replacement. Yeah. Yeah, that looks like it uh, may be a little bit too far gone. And I mean, that's uh, that's not like a chocolate milk consistency. It doesn't look like there. So that's going to yeah. that's going to gum up a lot of components. And I think that, again, with the um, an older system that a big cast iron boiler and this this pipe size may have been a little bit more forgiving of that. If you were going to just throw in a new modulating condensing boiler into that system, just with a, a cut and paste, you, you wouldn't be setting yourself up for success there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next slide. So this was such a cool update. Do you want to tell us about the machines in this room here? This is from, uh, from left to right. It's just a, a sure. very cool snapshot of what a mechanical room would have looked like. Uh, <laughs> many years ago this is this is all original of course um now on the left uh, in, in in my neck of the woods uh haven't really seen too many in operation still but that is a a, a gas fired incinerator um and uh, obviously that's gone now um and then you know to the right of that is just your standard enormous uh, cast iron sectional boiler um obviously once oil fired if, if i don't know if you can see it but this tiny little uh, conversion burner on it um and then to the right of that was a uh, was a rude uh, laundry master um and uh, there was other pictures with this job I am, it looks like I'm going to die coming up the stairs uh, uh, with that thing. But uh, I, I was telling the guys yesterday that uh, I didn't scrap it. But uh, the guy that did, I think he got like close to $1,000 uh, in, in scrap for that insane. And then to the right of that, that uh, archaic looking uh, uh, metal stand is an old original uh, uh, hydronic air handler. Um, so that was all upgraded. That wasn't done by me. But the, uh, 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 so yeah, quite uh Quite, quite a low to uh, 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 upgrade. Yeah, it's a cool a cool snapshot of, uh, of all those old mechanical room machines and just the, the garbage incinerator is such a, an interesting <laughs> yeah. one too. That like, yeah, I mean, that made sense at a time. Uh, yeah, yeah, it did. Neighbors probably weren't that happy about that or <laughs> the smell coming out of that thing. But actually, so now, a, a side note I was saying yesterday yeah, was that the owner of this home originally has passed away since, but he was one of the originators of uh, of uh, elastic uh, uh, spandex material. So, so that's how you get yeah. garbage incinerators. You got to invent spandex. I got it. <laughs> some prototypes went into that. Some uh, right. black smoke came out for uh, right. yeah. Yeah. twenty years or something. <laughs> so then we move over to the upgrade. So there's a pretty big difference here what were some of the the upgrades from a comfort standpoint that you noticed here was this just a little bit easier to get key to the right places in this building well we didn't go with a high efficiency because i really didn't see the point i mean it was all a high temperature load uh, uh, house um upstairs uh, uh, a lot of baseboard besides the air handler vents um and undersized quite a bit a lot of half inch on on the uh, uh, feeds to, to the baseboard itself um, so it, there was plenty of uh, basement and makeup air, so it, it really wasn't uh, a, a question on that end. Um, and then uh, the uh, uh, the indirect tank itself, that was a no-brainer. Yeah, and I think that that's a good point about the baseboard upstairs, because there are a lot of places that with an outdoor reset curve, you could go with lower temperatures in the shoulder season for existing baseboard in an old building like that. If it's undersized and if there's half inch pipe going to it, you know, you might be more limited with a minimum temperature that you would need to get an effective heat out of it. But it's worth taking a look if that had been an uh, oversized baseboard or something like that, then I'm sure the approach you know, would be different and it gives you more options, but you don't want to oh, set yeah. somebody up to have cold rooms in the shoulder season. That's, that's, right. that's right. And it was more, it was a lot more even heat uh, throughout the home after that too. Yeah, great. So then on the next slide, I wanted to kind of see, we have products with press and NPT and sweat connections. Um, how do you as an installer decide when to make that kind of switch from piping materials? So kind of on the, 
The bottom there, you can see the air separator and the expansion tank coming out of the boiler that's uh, that's threaded. But then coming out of the circulator on the top there, it's it's switched over to press. So when do you kind of make those decisions to switch piping materials in a project like that? Well, typically I'll do a, a nice setup with a manifold and a whole board. But uh, in this case, uh, kind of unfortunately, the homeowner just had this he was just like a wannabe carpenter and just tools everywhere uh uh, uh it was unacceptable to him to to move stuff around so uh, whatever uh so in this case uh, a cast iron boiler shoved into the corner you can see the field stone uh, foundation it would have been tough to get a board up there anyway but uh off this cast iron boiler just the black steel like a lot of other guys uh we'll use it as the rigidity uh, of uh, uh some of the near near boiler piping so but then grandfather yeah. clock in there or something like that that you couldn't <laughs> disturb <laughs> jimmy hoffa the uh uh but but going up uh in copper we we tied in uh, uh uh to the rest of it okay yeah and the uh it this looks like it, it would be a hard one to set with that that floor there too to get everything plumb and yeah. straight i'm oh, sure yeah. that was a little bit more work than normal shims yeah and also let me just say to, to everybody watching this job was not finished, so there was no drip on the relief, et cetera, et cetera. So. <laughs> Don't want anybody oh, yeah. to, that's to, right. uh, to Matt, add you on you, Instagram after this. I was going to say, Matt, you should know that nobody on the internet judges people. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, nobody does that, So, especially our viewers. I can't wait to well, see the comments. I would say on the next slide, um, if anybody who has a, a comment about the uh, the relief valve thinks that their truck is more organized than this, they're they're happy to send us a photo. But uh, tell <laughs> us a little bit about just kind of the organization it takes to keep in good shape during heating season, because I'm sure that there's some days that you'll get eight calls before 8 a.m. Uh, how do you and your team of of your two sons, which I think is yeah. cool, and right. you've got the uh, the apprentice in the front seat of the the van there running to get some parts. So it's you've got the whole the whole yeah. family team. That's right. So how do you keep the the truck in shape to make sure that you're kind of uh, rolling up to every single job site prepared during the peak heating season? Uh, pretty easy, actually. Believe it or not. Um, this is a, a, a this is the Sprinter Mercedes. Prior to that, I had a GMC box truck uh, with the exterior compartments. I could not keep the thing organized for for, for my life. So uh, so when I found out that the uh, company Hackney, uh, when they I, when I realized that they made this setup for the Sprinter, it, I I had always wanted it. So there's some pack out in it, which has been phenomenal as far as tools, especially tools you don't use every day. Um, and then there's my electrical kit in there to, to grab. But the main part of the back of the cargo area, you, you can see with the Hackney shelves, the uh, the gray bins, super easy to, to see what you have or you don't have. Um, and on this particular, my, uh, this is my truck, uh, I don't know if you can see those white labels, but they're all uh, 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 SKUs or, or uh, you know to, to code, and they'll correspond with the supply house as far as uh, uh, their site goes. So I can literally order my stuff as I use it, you know, which has just been fantastic. Um, clean up on the truck itself. Well, my younger son Ben, he is now the apprentice, so uh, his job. <laughs> And you guys have some cool photos of like uh, scuba diving and stuff on the feed too. So uh, yeah, yeah, me, yeah. Me, me and Ben scuba dive. No, me and Ben ride motorcycles. Me and Russ scuba dive. Okay, there we go. So uh, you're covered wherever in the, uh, yeah. the greater uh, uh, New England area <laughs> you need on a boat or under a bridge. Or That's right. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Matt, for giving us a, a tour through kind of uh, your eyes out in the, the field, what's going on and how you're adapting to these job sites. We really appreciate you joining us as a guest. And we're going to wrap up with, uh, I'm going to pass it back over to Cody Mack. He's going to do a five things you need to know about uh, heating season. Hey right there, guys. Oh, th thanks again, Matt. It was great having you and everything like that. Uh, just one more thing to think about it. If you got an apprentice, uh, you know, you mentioned about lugging heavy things out of the basement. I am 99% sure that that's the apprentice's job is to, to lug the heavy stuff out of basement. So sa that's save right. your back. So, um, Absolutely. Guy, guy a plumber says to me last night, hey, let me see your hands because they're getting cleaner. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with you there. Uh, 
I'm not so dirty anymore these days. All right, so now we're gonna go through five things we need to know as technicians in the field, installers, service people, and you know, hopefully this helps a lot of the design guys as well. We're gonna talk about the five things that we need to know. Uh, you know, just some, these are things that we get calls about quite frequently at Kalefi. You know, they may or may not even pertain to our product. Uh, so we just wanna make sure that this is all stuff that you're aware of. Now, Bob uh, spoke about air vents before. He spoke about how air vents are really good at letting air out. They're really good at letting air in. Uh, he also mentioned about how air vents have a tendency to leak. And so one of my favorite questions is, and I, you know, we we sell air vents by the millions. Okay, we we've moved tons and tons of air vents, and I would I hate to even imagine how many of them are actually installed as replacements, not necessarily just new installs. Uh, so one of my favorite questions to ask is, is you know, why did you replace the air vent? And the, you know. Typical answer is it was leaking, you know, which is the third thing that air vents are really good at. And so then I always ask, well, did you take it apart? And they they said, well, yeah, I took it apart. What'd you find in there? You know, uh, I found some dirt in there. Okay, well, then what did you do? You know, what'd you do? I replaced the air vent. Okay, then what? Then I wrote up the invoice. Okay, and and what I really want to get across here is the fact that if you've got an air vent that you found a ton of debris in that was leaking all over the place, like this picture on, on the right-hand side here, this is all a fantastic segue to start talking to your customer about purging and flushing, cleaning these systems up, putting in dirt separators. You know, as an industry, we are so incredibly focused on the combustion side so much that we're worried about the, you know, the, the, the gas train, that we're worried about the, the burner, we're worried about all this stuff. We really need to focus a lot more on the water side because if we've got a lot of dirt running around these systems, that's going to act as a really great insulator to prevent heat transfer, you know, so everybody's worried about soot, you know, in a, you know, say an oil boiler application, obviously that's going to prevent heat transfer, but what about the dirt on the other side of, of the heat exchanger there? So, so again, if you're ever, you know, again, looking at air vents, you know, it's leaking, yeah, replace it, sure, but really take a, a good look at the rest of the system there too. And Bob mentioned that little fitting that we can actually take it over to a quarter inch NPT and, and divert away. Another quick little tip here, we actually sell an air vent with uh, with a cap on it here that we call a hygroscopic safety cap. Now this cap actually allows you to thread it all the way on and it seals off with an O-ring at the bottom here. You can kind of see it in the cutaway there. But at the top, you're actually gonna have these little fibrous wafers in there. And those wafers, when they're dry, they let air come out but if they get wet, they swell up and they seal and they prevent it from leaking all over the place. So again, great application for the top of a boiler, um, great application for above a ceiling grid, you know, and, and things like that. So definitely keep that in mind. And again, just remember that if it's dirty inside your air vent, it's going to be dirty everywhere else too. All right, next thing, uh, valves. Oh my goodness, valves. So we, you know, when I was in the field, we would go toe to toe with a lot of the installing contractors in the area. Sometimes we're even putting in the exact same model of boiler. And in a lot of cases, our bids were gonna be a thousand or $2,000 more expensive. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that we were very proactive with isolation valves. And, you know, we all know ball valves are expensive, you know, uh, valves in general are expensive. So not only do we need to have valves on these systems to, to make them just easier to service, but I would always recommend having some type of fill purge setup. You can kind of see it on, on the picture in the upper right here. You basically got two drains with a, with a ball valve in the middle. And this, this setup here, I kind of call it your fill and purge setup. This is a fantastic device to have, even if you're not necessarily using it on initial fill, but if you ever have to come back to flush a system, you know, with a utility pump or some kind of flush cart or add chemicals or anything like that, this is a great thing to have because it allows you to push water in one side and with the valve off, you can kind of direct that flow wherever you need to go. And then if you do have those isolation valves, wherever you need them, you can then start isolating down different parts of the system to really help you flush and purge that system out the best you can and take it in little chunks as opposed to trying to flush and purge an entire system um, because maybe you just don't have enough pump to be able to get the velocities up to kick that dirt and debris around. So again, valves in your system, um, you know, fill and purge setups like this on your common return are gonna be a great, great tool to, to really help with service down the road. All right, now, <clears throat> this is something that we do see and then people might think that this is a little crazy, but whenever you're putting in a mixing valve, okay, you need to bring the return back from that low temp zone and you need to have it go directly to the cold inlet of that mixing valve first before it goes anywhere else, okay? So there's a lot of times when you're in the boiler room and the return's coming back from a low temp zone, like what you've got here on the, the far left-hand side, this is your, gonna be your low temp return. Sometimes geographically or, Aesthetically, it might be 
nicer to have it go back to the common return over here. But say, for example, we've got three zones of high temp, okay? And you've got returns coming back from that three zones of high temp that might be 160 degrees, maybe a little bit less. You've got the low temp return coming back at maybe 120 or 115. And now all of a sudden we're expecting this low temp return to make its way backwards through this common return back to the cold inlet of the mixing valves. And that's just not gonna happen because it's gonna mix up on its way back. And now all of a sudden we've got 180 coming into the hot side of this mixing valve and, and now maybe 145 coming into the cold side. And we're expecting that mixing valve to make 120 or 125 out of it, okay? the only way you're going to be able to get those low temperatures out of the mixing valve is to have a lower temperature than your desired mix coming into the cold side. So what we really want to do is more like this. So again, the common return, you know, you've got your common return here, but that cold or that return coming back from that low temp zone needs to come back and hit that cold inlet first and then make its way back to the to the common return. So that way, again, you can have, uh, you know, proper or proper temperatures for the, the low temp zone that we're trying to serve. All right, <clears throat> next one here is glycol, okay? Um, again, we see it often, okay? Uh, glycol is becoming more and more common in some of these systems, and we're probably gonna see more and more glycol use as we get into these monoblock style air to water heat pumps and things like that as well. If you are using glycol in your hydronic system, for the love of Pete, do not connect it up to potable, okay? The fact is, is that if you've got a, a, fill, a fill valve, like a typical backflow fill valve, one, uh, you know, your dual check with a vent might not be appropriate for, you know, hazard uh, applications to your connection to your uh, potable water supply. But two, if you have a leak somewhere inside that hydronic system and you're leaking out glycol, now all of a sudden you've got a an autofill valve that's trying to maintain pressure so it's bringing in fresh water, okay? And and in that case, you're going to be diluting your glycol uh, to the point where it's probably not even going to be useful anymore. And hopefully you don't lose power or, or have a failure in the boiler because now all of a sudden you've got literally no protection whatsoever. So I would always encourage you, uh, if you're using glycol, disconnect the potable side. Uh, use a glycol pig like uh, Bob was mentioning or some type of a glycol feeder. There's plenty of them out there now. Um, don't connect this to potable because it's just going to make your lives miserable. And we're going to give you a little two for one here. Okay. The next thing I want you to think about is how much glycol do you really need? Okay. Um, you know, a lot of times everybody defaults to this 50 50 glycol water mixture. Okay. And, and Max and I were talking the other day in Salt Lake, design temperature is going to be four, what was it, Max? 14 degrees? Yeah. So positive 14. <laughs> So Positive, I think not even negative. Yeah, if so. you click one more, yeah, there's the the. I think a line comes up if you click one more time. Oh. So oh. there you go. If we're shooting for 50% glycol here, it's just so overqualified for what we're trying to do in Salt Lake City. If you're talking about an airport in Fairbanks or something like that, like <laughs> right. yeah, that probably makes sense. Um, but even yep. the the freeze point and the burst temperature too is you know those are two different numbers and two different curves that you should be able to get from your glycol uh, manufacturer whoever you use. So even the if you went up to fifty percent, if it hit negative sixty, it, the, like that red line doesn't change much. It just kind of goes straight down at some point too, and that's the burst temperature. So not just after it's kind of turns into slush, but after it freezes hard enough to you know break out of the copper pipe. It's a 50-50 doesn't even help there beyond the 40. So what we you know, talked about before is somewhere probably above 20 to you know 20 to 30 probably makes a lot of sense for a lot of markets, but that just default to 50-50, as Cody was saying, uh, hurts more things in the hydronic system than it helps if, uh, if you're not gonna get down to negative 30 degrees uh, Fahrenheit in the system. Right. And, and you know, again, we were having this conversation the other day and Bob made a great comment. He said, the only thing positive about glycol is the fact that it doesn't freeze. But in a hydronic system, beyond that, everything is a negative. You're going to have, you know, reduced uh, heating uh, capabilities because it just it can't transfer heat as well. You're going to have a, a penalty on your pumping power, too, because it's going to be more viscous liquid. So it's going to be harder to push around. Uh, so, you know, talk to your glycol manufacturers. A lot of them will recommend no less than 25 or 30 percent glycol in a lot of cases. Uh, but by all means, it doesn't necessarily mean you need, like, that you need to default to that 50-50 that we talked about before. All right. Now, the last one, uh, if I can get the clicker to work here, there we go, is low return temperatures. Now, 
when you're talking about high efficiency boilers, they literally thrive on, on low return water temperatures. That's how they're going to condense. You're going to get your latent heat. You're going to get your, you know, your 92, 93, 94% efficiencies out of it. But I'm also here to tell you that any other kind of boiler can be a condensing boiler uh, if you do it wrong enough. Okay. So, so what we're really trying to avoid with these, you know, typical cast iron and copper fin tube boilers is we're trying to avoid sustained condensation in your flue gases. Uh, so on a cold start, they're always going to condense, uh, but we want to get out of that condensing mode as quickly as possible. So you'll find in a lot of cases, um, a lot of your manufacturers will recommend a bypass from supply to return. Okay, and the whole idea behind that bypass is to try and bring the boiler return up in temperature as quickly as possible to prevent sustained flue gas condensation. Now, what, what kind of symptoms are you going to see with sustained flue gas condensation? You're going to see what you see on the left hand side over here. You're going to see a lot of your single wall venting, your draft hoods, you know, things like that. They're going to start breaking down. Okay, and if you're starting to, to replace single wall venting on a regular basis, uh, that that's just a symptom of a bigger issue, especially if it's got that rot line down the bottom of the, the you know, the very center on the bottom, you know, where the water, the condensate's dripping down. That condensate's very acidic and it will literally chew right through that galvanized sheet metal, no problem. Okay, so, so again, the manufacturers are really concerned about keeping that, you know, return temperature up. So they're going to recommend a bypass. Now, uh, a bypass there, the, the common question that we get is how, how do you set that bypass? We're literally talking about a ball valve, okay? How do you set that? And the problem is, is that there's really no definitive way to say that because if you, you know, if you think about it on a cold start, you want that bypass to be completely open. You want to bypass as much as possible to bring the return temperature up as quickly as possible. But once the system is up to temperature, once the return is kind of out of that condensing range that we talked about before, we don't need the bypass anymore. So, so now all of a sudden you've got a bypass that's open, maybe halfway open, maybe three quarters open, maybe three quarters closed, whatever. It's too much. And, and it's a, now a parasitic uh, kind of thing that's going on with the system that we don't need to have anymore. So, you know, obviously a bypass, you know, you'd look at the manufacturer's instructions. They're going to recommend that because that's a good way to cover their rear ends on the boiler side of things. Uh, but ultimately, as an industry, if you're looking for something to control return water temperature, whether it be because of, you know, again, cold starts or maybe you've got a high volume system with a lot of water that just takes a really long time to heat up. Maybe you're running low temp heat emitters on a, uh, you know, a cast iron boiler, you know, you're, you're bringing back returns of 110 degrees, you're going to be in that condensing zone. So instead of using a bypass like this, you know, a, a more appropriate idea, a more appropriate application would be something like this. This is going to be our thermal protect. And this is actually basically like a dumbed down mixing valve is what it is, but it's very high flow capabilities. And what you'll find here is this is like a thermostatic mixing valve. And the fact that on a cold start, it will be wide open to the bypass. And as the temperature starts to increase, it will start to close down the bypass until it gets to a specific temperature, depending on the cartridge. And it will then shut off the bypass and it will just basically go supply return, you know, back and forth. And, and this is a really cool device here uh, that again, will help save a lot of issues that you're finding this heating season again with with condensing boilers that aren't supposed to be condensing boilers and uh just some something to think about there so if you run into this kind of thing definitely uh definitely think about it because uh because it again could save your save your butts and just as a general rule um you know i always try to recommend keeping your eyes open on these job sites because what you think might be the problem, you know, like a dirty air vent, it's leaking. I replaced the air vent. That is typically, in a lot of cases, a, a symptom of a much larger issue that needs to be addressed because, you know, you just replace the air vent. As an example, we talked about before, who's to say the new one's not going to be all dirty and leaking the next year? Okay. So, so again, you know, look at the bigger picture. And uh, beyond that, I think we're going to finish it up here, Max, with the, uh, with the closing slides and answer any questions that we might have. Yeah, one more for this, for that slide. That oh, sure. Th what you do when you've got that bypass ball valve that doesn't really effectively like have much of valve authority until it's almost completely closed is you stand in that mechanical room and if it, you, you're starting to sweat, then you close it a little bit to let more water out <laughs> to the building. And then if you see that the, you know, the vent has rusted out or is starting to drip for more than that, we'll just the combustion. So you're gonna have to be down there for a really long time might be you know, days or months. Uh, Hopefully as you get paid by the hour. Yeah. <laughs> so just build that into that, that, that less expensive, the 
the material cost of the ball valve is less, but having someone physically adjust that ball valve up and down all day is going to be a lot more expensive. There was a, a question in the chat. You could absolutely do that with injection mixing or yeah. some other electronic strategy. Four way mixing valve. valves, too. Yeah. Yeah, so this is just a pretty low tech, pretty simple way to make sure that even if you know the controls were struck by lightning or something like that, you're just always going to have the right return temperature going back to the boiler. So your um, your idea of sweating versus not sweating, really, I was getting some flashbacks of uh, my refrigeration and air conditioning days of beer can cold uh, kind of mentality yeah. when they talk about charging systems. So don't do that. Let, make it easier on yourself. Use a device like this or injection or a four-way mixing valve with a proper control. Uh, this is going to make, make the jobs a, a lot more efficient, a lot more effective. So. Yeah. Um, any right. of the Kalefi team, any other questions we should address or should we kind of roll through the... Um, yeah, we'll do the last slides here and then we'll see if there's anything at the end. So you can call and talk to most of the people that have been on the, the uh, webinar today. We have live uh, answer of the, the phone. This is a direct line to tech support, which is helpful too. So um, you don't have to go through the phone, full phone tree if you know exactly what you're looking to solve with Greg's help or something like that. You can call right to that number. And then uh, also Greg and Dan do the Ask Kalefi podcast. So similar stories. They're just going to be in an audio format that you can listen to on the way to work, but we cover a lot of uh, cool topics here. And really, they're all just kind of ripped from the, the tech support lines, calls that we get quite a bit to say, okay, here's what you're going to need to look for. We're getting, you know, now it's uh, heating season. We're getting calls about zone relays and things like that. Here's what to look for there. And uh, as kind of is evident today, we love to see what you're doing on social media. And if you tag us in the posts, we'll like and, and share, and maybe you'll even be a, a guest on Coffee with Kalefi like Max. We love to hear the backstories to these cool projects and, and the problem solving that happens out in the field. So with that, let's go to questions. If anybody else on the call has something else that they want to bring up or any other question from the, the chat here. Yeah, I was trying to keep an eye on the questions, Max, from the chat. And I think we got pretty much most of them covered there. If there were any of the questions that we did not get to, we'll definitely get back to you after the webinar today. And again, like Max said, if there was any questions that you have that, that you, you want to touch base with us on, definitely call uh, our tech support line and get a hold of us there. Um, there were some questions about the bypass valve uh, modulating and things like that. Um, I'm going to go back one slide here. We just got a question in about what was the tech support number again. Um, so there we go. We'll slide back to back to that guy right there, 414-338-6338. Uh, so again, that'll take you directly to the tech support line. You can talk to uh, Matt DeLuca, Greg Tubbs, myself, or Kevin, or even I think Dan's still in the tech support line there too. But uh, but yeah, so I think that just about covers it there. There's one more just kind of back to Dan's part for the controls. One of the, and I don't know if I've mentioned this in Coffee with Coffee before, one of the trickiest troubleshooting things on the electrical side, uh, Greg Burney, uh, who works in Colorado, had gone to this job site that they could not keep the zones open. And he's, you know, he's been there four times and he's doing all this troubleshooting, he's helping the contractor. And everything's working while he's there and he leaves and he gets a call that the house is cold again. So he leaves the last time and he closes the door of the mechanical room and just like kind of defeated, doesn't know why this won't work as soon as he leaves because it works great while he's there. And he turns off the light and he closes the door and he hears all the zone valves close. He hears the like, zzz, zzz, that's kind of all the zone valves wide, wind back. So he goes back in and he flips on the light and they all come back to life. So whoever put the zone valves in use a transformer that was connected to the light switch so the system worked great as long as you remembered to leave that light on and uh, I don't know if that ever comes up in anybody's career but make sure that the light that you're using is a, the mechanical room light isn't isn't the key to all your electrical worries <laughs> I think it was uh, Motel 6 that uh, had the solution there. Uh, the light, on, the yeah. light on for you, you know. Uh, so, so definitely do that. Don't, don't, don't do that. Definitely keep it on its own circuit and everything else. Yeah, electrical troubleshooting is is always a, a, a topic of discussion on these job sites, you know, uh, just because of that c c the controls. I mean, if they're not working, obviously they're kind of the the conductor for the whole symphony there. So, uh, so definitely keep that in mind. And and uh, I think that's about it. Uh, Max, this was awesome. Matt LeBeau, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you know, we, we definitely appreciate all your, your knowledge and everything like that today. Uh, anything else to add there, Max? 
No, I think we're good. So if uh, we missed your question, we'll get back to you by email and we'll see you next month for John Siegenthaler to talk about air to water heat pump hybrid systems with uh, hydronics. So see you then. Thanks guys. Thanks.